Hello, and welcome to part two of Senior Developer in 24 Hours. In the second part, we're going to talk about identifying and analyzing user requirements. All right, so let's get started. Let's talk a little bit about the workflow of a developer. And this is normally a cycle. First thing they will do, they will pick up a ticket. They will work on this ticket for however long it takes to finish. They will then close the ticket, which likely means getting the code submitted, approve, merge, and so on. Once the ticket has been closed, they're going to take a look and, hey, do I have more tickets? If I have more tickets, they're going to pick up another one and the cycle repeats on and on. Okay, so what we're going to do here, we're going to take a look a little bit outside of that workflow to get a better understanding of how those tickets get created. Because at the end of the day, someone has to generate those tickets. And maybe as a senior developer, we are involved in generating those tickets. Maybe not. Maybe it is they are created by some other person within the organization. But it is important for us to understand the process so that we can take part in it if necessary uh, to make sure that we have high quality tickets that we can work with. And let's keep in mind that what we're basically doing in this process is taking something abstract or vague, which are, you know, user requirements and turning them into something actionable tickets. And for this, we're going to use a structure approach where we go from user requirements to tickets. And we do this by first starting with the requirements, then creating some more cohesive user journeys, creating the higher level epics, and then going into the more detailed tickets that we're going to actually work on. All right, so let's talk a little bit about some of the terminology that we're going to use throughout this presentation. Uh, the first one is user journey. And a user journey is a set of steps that a user takes to accomplish a goal. And we're going to go into a lot of detail regarding what a user journey is. Uh, we have an epic. An epic is a large body of work with a unifying theme. And normally, an epic is basically a collection of tickets. It can be a handful of tickets. It can be a very large number of tickets. But it is basically a way to group tickets together. And finally, you know, what is a ticket? A ticket is the smallest unit of work that a developer undertakes. And depending on your methodology, a ticket can also be called a task or a user story, depending, you know, on the type of software that you're using to track them or methodology, you know, Agile has its own set of terminologies that come along with the with the whole process. Okay, normally we want to have a structured approach that we can follow when we're doing these kinds of processes. And basically here, we start gathering the user requirements. We then take those user requirements, turn them into user journeys. From the user journeys, we can create the high level epics. And then from the high level epics, we can go into the more detailed tickets. But let's start with the user requirements. Okay, uh, so who provides the user requirements? Ideally, the user requirements are going to come from the users. Ideally, the users are going to have some kind of mechanism that are going to allow them to tell us what they want to see in the software. Uh, sometimes this is gathered by product owners. Product owners tend to be people within the organization who provide, among other things, that interface between the users and the development team. 
And part of the responsibilities is to gather these requirements. Uh, the user requirements could potentially also come from the business analyst. A uh, business analyst will take a business process, they will break that process apart and generate user requirements based on that business process. Uh, also, user requirements could come from the quality assurance team. If you have a quality assurance team in your organization, they tend to be very experienced using the software, using the application, so they can provide some pretty good user requirements on their own. Okay, so how exactly do we gather these user requirements? When we're trying to gather them from the user, you know, it could be, for example, uh, doing surveys to the users. We could have interviews or focus groups with the users. We could have observations of the users directly where we actually watch how the user is using our application to see what operations they're doing, to see what areas are causing the most frustration, to see what kind of operations they do uh, together, which might give us a clue that, hey, if we provide a unifying functionality that groups things that they do piecemeal, it could provide some nice uh, features that they want. If we have the authorization of our users, we can actually collect data from how they're using the application. We can instrument the application to see exactly how many users are clicking a particular button, to see the sequence of actions that users are taking, uh, and that will help us prioritize the areas that they're using, the areas that might be causing them uh, frustration because they do it over and over again, things like that. So with that said, what do those uh, requirements look like? Um, and they can look like anything, basically. Uh, user requirements tend to have very freeform format, at least in my experience, it might be different in your organization. Uh, but in here, we're assuming that they're basically any written description of something that a user could potentially get. Um, it could be fairly detailed in terms of what they want, but a lot of times it can also be something very, very vague or abstract, basically a wish list. Um, so with that, with that said, a lot of times we get user requirements that are not actionable, and these are extremely problematic. Uh, sometimes we could get user requirements that say, hey, we want to improve the application. Okay, sure, we want to improve it, but what does that mean? Uh, or maybe we want our users to be more engaged. Okay, well, right now, what is currently engaging our users? What can we do more of to increase that engagement? You know, those are things that we have to answer to turn this very vague, non-actionable user requirements into something more actionable. And we're going, we're going to go in, in, in detail as we go through the other steps of this approach to be able to make these things a lot more concrete. Um, you know, things like we want our applications to be easier to use. Okay, sure. Well, what does that mean? So in the next step, we're going to take things like this. We're going to try to lay them down piece by piece, break them apart, and have something that we can work off. And for this, what we're going to do is we're going to take our user requirements and we're going to turn them into user journeys. So basically what we're doing is we're breaking apart an abstract user requirement and we're turning that into a coherent user journey. Now, what are the main things that a user journey are going to describe and define for us? The first thing is, who is the user? 
who is the person that is going to be using this functionality. And this is important to define because everything that we do is going to be from their perspective. So we have to understand what is the perspective that we're going to be taking. Second thing, what are they trying to accomplish? Whenever the user is using our application, they have a goal in mind. So we want to describe exactly what is it that they're trying to accomplish. And finally, what steps do they need to complete to be able to achieve this goal? Normally a user journey, you know, like the name says, it's a journey that involves several steps and each step is getting our user closer to that particular goal that he had in mind. Okay. So to make this a little bit more understandable, I personally like to map user journeys, normally in a whiteboard, whether it's a physical whiteboard or a virtual whiteboard, and allow people to brainstorm, to add their own uh, ideas as we are taking the user requirements that we have and we break them apart. Normally we start breaking them apart again by figuring out who is the user. And in this particular case, the user that we're going to use for this example is a field technician. Now, what is this field technician trying to accomplish? The field technician is out on a call, they're visiting a customer, and they want to enter a work order to create a record of something that has to be done to the customer and, you know, to be able to record the details of this particular work order. Okay, so what steps do we think this user needs to complete to be able to achieve this goal? And in here, we want to talk to subject matter experts, we want to talk to users to be able to map out all of these steps. So, for example, we want the user to be able to authenticate into the system because we want to have a certain level of security. We want the user to be able to locate the customer record to make sure that the work order is properly assigned to the right customer. We want to locate a work order template because, you know, there's only certain types of work orders that we do and we want to be able to take a template and we want to adjust that template to ensure that it has the right detail, that it has the right materials that we think are going to be needed to complete the process. So in here we have the three basic elements that we were talking about. We have who the user is, we have what are they trying to accomplish, and we have the steps that they're trying to, the steps that they're going to have to execute to be able to accomplish the goal. Now, I have another example here. And in this example, it's a little bit different because the user is not a human being. The user is actually another system, the procurement API. Now, in cases like this, keep in mind that your user might be a human or they might be another system that is accessing that is accessing your system programmatically. So for example, in this hypothetical case, the procurement API wants to retrieve the materials that are needed for pending work orders. So again, we have a user, we have what they're trying to accomplish, and then we can also detail the steps that they need to complete in order to achieve their goal. So for example, here the procurement API would have to fetch the work orders using a particular filter. They will be able to retrieve the work order details. And of course, you know, they want to establish a secure connection to ensure that not anybody can access the procurement. You know, they have to provide some kind of credential, some kind of token to ensure that we have a secure connection. So using this methodology, we can go from user requirements to concrete, cohesive user journeys. And at the end of the exercise, each journey should tell us again, who is the user, 
what are they trying to accomplish, and what steps do they need to complete to be able to achieve this goal. We want to be able to document them somehow. In my opinion, sequence diagrams is a good way to document this. I'm going to show you a little bit of an example of how to use sequence diagrams for cases like this. And then once we have things, you know, properly documented, properly organized, we can prioritize the most important ones as we move into the next section. But before we jump into that next step, which would be the epics, let's go into something a little bit more practical, sequence diagrams. Uh, now, sequence diagrams is something that you might be familiar with, or maybe it's the first time you're seeing it. Sequence diagrams is actually a type of UML diagram, and it helps to document the interactions between different components. And, you know, we could have actors, we could have components, and they're basically talking to each other. We have a swim line, which is this vertical line that is dropping down from the actor or from the component. We have horizontal lines that show us messages that are going, or for example, messages that are coming back when we get a response. We can also keep track of asynchronous messages as opposed to synchronous messages. We can also use other constructs to show things like loops and while loops and things like that uh, to allow us to fully describe the interaction between the different components. And we could have multiple components. Uh, but one of the coolest things about sequence diagrams is that we can actually represent sequence diagrams as code, depending on which tool we're using. This, for example, is a sample snippet of plant UML. And plant UML is going to allow you to create a bunch of UML diagrams, but this one in particular is for the sequence diagram. And in here, you know, we can uh, we can define the actors, we can define the participants, which are the boxes that we show at the top, or, well, one is a box, the other one is a stick figure. And these are going to be uh, the elements. These are going to be the components that play a role. And then we start documenting the interaction between those components. For example, the actor is talking to the application, it's sending a message, it's getting a response back. Um, we can use different notations to represent asynchronous messages. Then we can define the, the loops. We can add the conditions for the loops, things like that, which allows us to very easily create the diagrams. We can edit the diagrams relatively quick. Uh, when I'm doing this, kind of a whiteboarding exercise, I can actually go ahead and create the sequence diagrams on the flow, on the on the fly, and get feedback from the users to see, hey, does this make sense? Does this does this look like what we're trying to represent from our user journey? And it really helps the conversation along because uh, then we can come up with something that we agree upon and it is which are the participants in the in the user journey and how does the flow look like so for example if we want to go back to the example we were talking about uh, we could represent part of the exchange for the creation of the work order with a sequence diagram that looks like this Basically, we have the field technician. The field technician is going to enter the username and password in the application. Once they submit, the application, the web application is going to send an authentication request to the authentication service. If the authentication service uh, sends a response that is successful, then we're going to show the main interface where the user can select work order, 
we can you know we can show the interactions between the user and the web application and we can also show the interaction between the web application and downstream components for example when we're querying for customers as we're typing the name and the work order service is sending us the list of matching customers here you know we're doing this asynchronously to provide a good user experience for the user and you know we could add even more detail to this this is a somewhat simple example to be able to fit it on a slide uh, but for example here we could have a case uh, where we handle for example if the authentication fails if there are no customers things like that but at the end of the day you know this is going to be a nice graphical representation that we can show to the users and they'll be able to understand at this from a high level what are the interactions between the user and the system at least how we envision it based on the user journey that we that we were trying to describe and trying to detail up to a point where we have something actionable that we can start working on okay uh, so with that said let's assume that we have properly documented our user journey now we want to take our user journey into the next step and that next step would be epics all right so before we start talking about epics themselves uh, we want to understand a little bit what is the context that we are operating in and here is where the more abstract nature of the user requirements has to be uh, has to be combined with the reality of the environment that we are going to be developing in to be able to create a workable solution so are we talking about a greenfield application are we starting from scratch and we have no services to interact with are we thinking more of a brownfield situation where we're starting from scratch but we have a bunch of legacy systems a bunch of legacy services that we have to interact with or are we in a maintenance mode where we have something that is fully established and we're just adding more functionality to it uh, you know this is going to affect whether we are going to have to build something from scratch whether we can reuse something that we already have can we use a library can we use a service all of those things so in here we're starting to go from the more theoretical part of like hey the user wants to do this to this is how we can accomplish what the user wants okay so we have user journeys we want to turn them into epics how is this going to look like ideally we can start with one epic per user journey kind of the simplest approach um, we have broken up our very big user requirements into more cohesive uh, user journeys those user journeys will we clearly define who the user is what they're trying to achieve and what are the steps that they need to achieve so it makes sense that you know they will map one to one to an epic that might be a good place to start however once we start going through them there are certain things that are going to rise to the surface that will be common functionality across multiple epics across multiple user journeys and here's where we have to use our judgment and say hey this common functionality we're going to abstract it away into another epic because at the end of the day the epic epics will have dependencies and we have to understand the dependencies that, that they have to be able to properly prioritize them and to be able to properly work around these dependencies okay 
So let's go back to our example. The field, te uh, field technician out there talking to a customer, they need to create a work order. They need to be able to authenticate into the system. They need to be able to locate the customer record. They need to be able to locate a work order template and they need to be able to adjust the materials based on the template that they've copied. Okay, so at a first pass, how would this look like? We're talking about one single user journey. So we can convert that into one epic. A field te uh, technician needs to create a new work order. Simple enough. We can follow the different steps. Maybe each step is going to map into a ticket. Maybe not. Maybe we'll have multiple tickets depending on the steps. Here we have to start again taking the technology agnostic view of the user journey and translating this into things that are going to be a little bit more concise that are going to allow us to actually implement what we want. So for example, hey, we want to create an authentication endpoint. Uh, we want to create an endpoint to search for customers. We want to create an endpoint to search for work order templates. And then finally, create an endpoint to adjust materials. Sounds good, simple enough. Probably something that we can work with. But then, you know, we start looking at other user journeys that we've talked about, about what the field technician is going to be doing out there. And we realize that actually creating the authentication endpoint is something that probably we can abstract away into yet another epic because it's going to be used by a bunch of different user journeys. And in fact, we need to add a little bit more on top of it. So rather than creating just the authentication endpoint as part of this epic, we're going to create another epic, which is going to provide a full authentication mechanism for us. So here we start talking about creating the authentication endpoint and also creating some kind of user management functionality. And here, now that we have the epics, we can start thinking about how do we create each particular ticket. And we're going to keep talking about tickets in our next video. Okay, so in this video, we talked a lot about how do we gather user requirements? How do we go from user requirements into user journeys? How do we go from user journeys into epics? And we started talking about how do we go from epics into tickets, but we haven't really talked about how do we create the tickets. So in the next video, we're going to talk about, hey, what are good ways in which we can create the tickets? What data should we have there to make them actionable? And we're also going to talk about yet another process in which we can create those tasks that we're going to be working on within our development cycle. And that is collecting high quality bug reports. Unfortunately, not all of the work items that we work with come through the happy path. Sometimes they come in as bug reports that we also have to address. So we're going to talk about that. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this, don't forget to subscribe. Again, we're going to be having a new video every week. Follow me on Twitter, follow me on Mastodon, and also feel free to check out my website, www.javaprocess.com. Thanks everybody.